Hi, Olivia. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hi. So uh, I've been really excited about this conversation for some time since I, st I, I, I don't even know how I stumbled on your Twitter account. It was a while ago, but I was, I found one of your tweets in my bookmarks and I was like, oh, that's a good tweet. I should look at this account some more. And then it was just like, these are amazing <laughs> tweets. So uh, well, it really warms my heart so much to hear that you got something out of them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, and hope to dive in a bit deeper uh, tonight. So uh, maybe just to start, could you share a bit about yourself and your life story and your background and anything that you'd like to share in any way is, would be, would love to hear that. Sure, so I grew up um, in California, in Ventura County. Um, my mom is half Japanese and half Irish and my father is black. And um, growing up, we didn't really have a lot of religion in the house because my mom grew up um, Buddhist and my dad grew up Pentecostal. So um, they both kind of stopped practicing religion. So religion wasn't really a part of my upbringing. Um, you know, had a normal high school, as normal as it can, it can be. Um, and then when I, I went just to college, um, studied communications. And then when I was 27, I decided to move to China. Um, I got an opportunity to teach there at a university and um, it had always been my dream to travel. Um, and so I went and everyone was like, oh my gosh, you're crazy. You're going to China. I, I, um, I wasn't like apprehensive at all about going. I felt like uh, this is a really good decision. And, and my plan was just to go for a year and I ended up traveling for 11 years. Um, I, I was in China and then I went to New Zealand, um, Thailand, India, Brazil, and came back in 2018. Um, to do my master's in social work. Um, and I work at a hospital, I'm a social worker, and then I'm starting my PhD in, a few, in psychology. Um, I wanna try to incorporate like spirituality into my practice. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's, it's it's difficult for me to like look back um, and, and thank God I was gone for 11 years. Um, it still doesn't feel real. And it was really hard coming back, trying to like acclimate myself back into the culture. And um, yeah, that's been really difficult. But those 11 years were just amazing. Um, I spent a year in India um, studying yoga and I did uh, my yoga teacher training and then I did meditation and just traveled all around. And I think that's when I really started getting into spirituality and really learning about like how effective meditation can be for someone like me who's always suffered from anxiety. Um, so that was really life changing. And yeah, I, <laughs> I've been back and just been grinding away at my master's and then starting my PhD and single, never married, never had kids, don't want kids. Um, that's never been like a goal of mine. I know even as a child, I never wanted kids. It just was never a dream of mine to have kids. So, yeah. How would you describe uh, to someone who's not familiar what your Twitter account is and what you're posting there? Okay, so my Twitter account, that started a, about a year ago. Um, and I post basically messages that I get um, from channeling. I started channeling um, in April of 2021. 
and didn't know where to put these messages, didn't know who to share them with. Um, I shared them with some people, but it was like, you could kind of see their eyes glaze over. They were just like, I don't know what to <laughs> make of this. But um, the messages were just so beautiful. And I'm like, there has to be someone out there that can get something. Cause it was just, they're just all about love and kindness and um, just, just so beautiful. So I just started posting them, um, hoping that someone would get something from them because I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do with the messages because they were just so profound, but I didn't know how to get them out. And again, like I, a few people kind of judged me when I told them what was happening and um, that made me kind of uh, embarrassed and feel like sh ashamed, um, maybe that this wasn't real or, um, so that's why I put my pseudonym as Sarah, because I was worried that like someone was gonna find them and or my employer or someone would Google me and then it would say my name and it would be just another, uh, I would get judged basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the period of time where you started receiving these messages and what that was like for you? Yes. Um, pandemic, beginning of the pandemic, um, I was like everyone else, you know, just like cooking a lot, going on a lot of walks. Um, and I was on dating apps and I met someone and uh, was sexually assaulted by this person. Um, and that was a very dark time. Extreme, I cannot explain how painful that was. Um, and then I, obviously dealing with police and that it didn't help. It just made it worse. Um, yeah, so that was a, just a very, very dark time. Um, you know, I would wake up just with this sense of dread, like, and, and then it was also the pandemic, so it was very isolated. I didn't know what to do with this pain. And so um, I started walking um, in the park. And I remember one day I was walking and this uh, uh, jolt of energy went up my spine. And it felt like, the only way I can describe it is like, it was like an orgasm in my back that kind of sexual energy, but just up my spine. And I am, it, it was a very strange feeling. Um, and then I think it was like a couple of days later, I walked outside and the, there was a hummingbird near my door and it had made its nest right in front of the door. And I looked at that hummingbird and I don't know what happened, but I just started crying because I felt like that hummingbird knew me. I know it sounds weird, but like I felt such a connection to that hummingbird. And every time I would go outside, the hummingbird would never leave. I could go up to it really close and, um, and it wouldn't leave. Um, so that kind of started what I like to call kind of the opening, you know, from going into this really dark place to, to me kind of opening up. And um, I came home one day and was really upset and really angry. And I was just, uh, just feeling very lost. And then, so I got on my phone on the notes app and just started writing. And it was like, it was like I went into like a trance almost and was just writing. But when I'm speaking to you now, I'm like, I can formulate the words in my mind. And, but this was not coming from my, from my mind. It's, it was 
it's difficult to explain, but um, when I read the messages back, I was like, okay, this is not me. This is very, it was very technical. Um, and I spent seven hours that day just channeling. And that was like one of the best days of my life. Yeah, and uh, the messages that I got that day said that they had to break me open, um, that the power is in, in the heart. In order to get to the heart, you have to be broken open. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was an amazing, amazing day. And what were some of the messages that uh, sort of touched you personally and have really stayed with you? How, how have those messages impacted you personally? Definitely the message about the power is in the heart, that the power, they said the powers in the shears and the shears had to go through your heart to break you open. Um, and then they said, they are um, beings who have gathered on um, a cosmic plane over many, many like different dimensions. Uh, it, was, it was very technical the way that they were saying it. It was almost like they were speaking like in the mathematical, um, but that I'm part of their, uh, a part of my, subconscious or conscious consciousness lies with them um and that they've been with me my whole life and yeah that was really powerful because there's so many moments where i felt so alone and just knowing that they were there was was everything it it was so healing to know that I wasn't going through this for nothing. This was all this pain that I was going through was so that um, my higher self or higher, a part of me that's not here could, could reach to me. That was really beautiful. And that we're all like the same, that message was really beautiful, that we're all made from one one creator um, and we're all made up of the same thing. It's just the way that we process things is differently, but underneath that is just one, one being having an experience that was really profound. The messages in themselves are just always about love. They've, they've never been about, um, you know, trying to get some status or what can I do to, they're just always, how do I bring all of that back to loving myself? And how can I share this love with other people? That's always, that's always the takeaway. How do you understand what you are doing and what is happening and who these beings are. Um, you mean when I first started or um, now? Or maybe both, but definitely definitely now. How do you understand it now? But also how maybe how has it evolved over time? Over time, it's it's I understood at the beginning them, as I said, like they were beings of light who gathered on this other. So, but now I understand them. They've told me that they have a name, that their name is Daisha, um, and that they are basically um, a part of me. That part I don't really understand. That I'm a part of them, they're part of me, but then they also said that they're, they have other people that they also contact who are also part of, of them. So I, I just, the way that I can kind of comprehend it to make sense to my, to my mind, because it's 
all of these things are just very, these concepts are just um, difficult to understand. I, I just think that they're a part of my like soul family, basically. Um, and that at some point I'll be reunited with them, but that for some reason I chose whatever part of the consciousness me chose to come here at this time to have an experience. How, how do you understand what's happening when you connect to them? Sorry, say that again. How do I understand what? Yeah, this sort of like activity of channeling or connecting to them or receiving messages. How do you understand what's happening there? Oh, um, I can feel, it sounds crazy, but I can feel them. Um, once I get into kind of a that trance-like state, like I have to move my hips around. Um, and once I start moving my hips around and moving, it, that energy comes back up, up my spine and I can feel them. It feels like just pure love. And it makes me cry sometimes because the love is just so powerful. Um, yeah. So I know like they're here, um, but, but I do have to, it doesn't, now that I've been like learning more about channeling, I see people who can just get it out, you know, speak it out, you know, just stop and take a deep breath. And I can't do that. I have to do a lot of work still. Um, they always tell me that I have to exercise, which is like the one thing I'm not doing um, because you said I have, I'm not in alignment. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't just go into it. I have to like really center myself. I have to sit for a while, move my hips around. Um, yeah. And then kind of just go into like a really, a really calm meditative state. Um, and I'm, so far I've only been able to, to write. I have never been able really to speak. I've tried to, but um, yeah, it, it hasn't gone that far yet. Is it hard because you're sort of in this trance state? To speak? Yes. I think it's because of my own insecurities, to be honest, because I feel like um, I still don't know. I, I, I'm just not comfortable speaking yet, so I don't know if the words are me or if it's them. Mm. With writing, I know. I could, I, I, it's like part of my brain shuts off. But with speaking, I just haven't honed in on that ability to not, to be in that such a meditative state where I can speak, but I'm still, uh, you know, my mouth is working, but my brain is shut off. Basically, I can't seem to hone in on that yet. And I think that just comes with practice or um, probably because I'm not in alignment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. How would, how would you describe what channeling is to someone that isn't familiar with it or maybe to your past self that before this all happened, how would you describe what it is? Oh my gosh. My past self would probably be like, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> it is a way to connect with, for me as part of my consciousness. So, you know, we, we study the, some people call it the super, conscious, the subconscious, the id, da, 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 da. it's a part of you, you know, science has recognized that there are parts of you that are not, um, that you can't connect with all the time, but they're there, you know, uh, when people say like, oh, that's your subconscious talking to you. Well, that's it. I think that it's being able to connect with that part of you, um, and receive messages without judgment, um, but not through your own brain, through your own processor. It's coming from another, it comes through a different processor, I guess, where it doesn't get diluted down. They're just, um, yeah. And, um, 
can you say you've talked about this a little bit but can you say again just how you like who you understand these beings to be and what your relationship with them is oh yeah so now i understand them to be um they say that they lie on the sixth dimension i still not sure how that the dimensions and all that work but they say that they lie on the sixth dimension that their name is daisha that they are a part of my consciousness that part of my consciousness still lies with them and that they gathered on another dimension uh, with other beings of light um, and that they also are connected with other people here on, on earth um, yeah and they say that they've been with me all my life which makes sense because when I was younger I remember like feeling like um, different like I remember looking at my house when I was younger and just being like I don't like these people I don't I don't know why I'm here um, but now it's it's it all cutting it out yeah let's do that for a second you said now it's all oh now it's all making sense I see Mm -hmm. And um, what what makes you uh, trust these beings and think that they're good or don't have bad intentions or something like that? That's a really good question. Um, for me, it's the feeling of love that I have when they're, it's a feeling that I can't describe it's like, it makes me cry um, because the love is just so powerful and it feels like I'm home or something. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's like a warm hug that you get from mm. someone you've known all of your life. Um, and then the messages that I get are just so beautiful and it's just... Yeah, I, I haven't had any real issues. I've had a few times where they've told me they're gonna cut the channel or that there's other beings that are trying to get in. And so they, they say they have to cut the channel and that I haven't done enough work. Um, Cause I have, you know, I have to do like a little bit of a ritual before I get into it. But if I don't do enough, then they'll, they'll say like, there's other beings trying to get in. But the first day that I started channeling I was getting, there was a, a Scottish guy coming in. There was, like, I was like, what is this? Yeah, I didn't know. And, and uh, slowly over time, I've learned like, you have to be, you have to do a little bit of work to make sure that you're getting the right messages from the, the people that are trying to harm you. Or I don't know if they were trying to harm you, but um it does, definitely didn't feel like uh, they were they were a part of my soul family, I guess. Hmm. But yeah, the first day was was very strange. Um, the, some of the messages I was getting, um, this guy was saying to a friend of mine named Barbara, like he was like, "Please, Barb, tell her." Like it was it was very weird. Hmm. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I, I know because of the feeling that I have. Who do you think it's possible to receive messages from? Like you've connected to these beings, Daisha, that you're connected to, but like who theoretically is it possible to connect to? I've connected with my grandma. She passed away um, a year ago. Um, and after she passed, I connected with her. That was really beautiful. That was like one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. Mm. Uh, feel her. I don't know how to explain it. Like when you're with someone and there's, you, you know, you can feel their energy, you know that how to speak to them, how they're going to react to things, you know them. That's how I felt. I could, I, I could feel her with me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was really beautiful. Um, they told me that I 
that I'm a channeler. I'm not a medium, that I'm not um, a psychic, but that I can channel energy, but that um, you usually have to be, if I'm gonna channel energy for, for someone else, it has to be someone that I, I know really well. I can't just do it for someone, you know, that asks me to. I've tried, um, but I don't know. It's, I, I don't feel it the way that I feel it with people that I know, like my grandma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or my mom's dad. Um, what, does yeah. it mean, what does it mean that um, you're a channel, but not a medium or a psychic? What, what's the difference there as you understand it? Um, they told me um, that there are other, um, I just can't believe I'm talking about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, I haven't really shared this much because it's, it's uh, it just sounds strange, but they've told me that, that when you pass on, because I, I had a friend whose husband died last, last year in a motorcycle accident and tried to connect with him for her. And they told me you can't do that. They said that when, um, when energies go on, oftentimes they'll go on to higher planes or higher dimensions, and that I don't have the ability to go there. That I can talk to them, they're on the sixth dimension, um, but I can't, I don't have the ability to go further on. Like I don't have the ability to, on those energies. Um, but that I can channel energies that are on the sixth dimension and from, pe from people's higher selves. Um, but that I have to have some kind of connection with that person. What is, um, what is the higher self as you understand it? Um, as I understand it, it's a part of your conscious consciousness that um, is on another not on this plane, but on another plane that doesn't have to, that doesn't have this, this, this brain, this system that everything has to get funneled into um, the way that it gets processed down here. It's the part of you that kind of guides you along your journey and tells you, um, you know, that inner voice that you have that tells you that don't do this, this is wrong. Um, I don't know if that definition makes sense, but that's the way that I understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Um. Mm. You mentioned, um, I know there's sort of like a few themes that they have shared in the messages that they've um, sent to you and that you've shared online. And um, maybe just to start, can you say more about the messages, messages about love and what the messages about love have to say? They always say that we are beings of love. At our core, at our essence, we are just pure love. And that um, you, all, everything that you need, everything, all the love that you you crave is inside of you already. You don't need to go look for it in someone else because if you, and it makes sense if you think about it, someone can make you feel a certain way, but those are feelings that you have inside. No one can turn a key and, you know, or press a button. You've got all of the love inside of you already. Um, and that once you find that love for yourself, uh, you can, share that love with other people and allow them to be themselves. That's like always one of the main things too, is just be yourself. Don't try to fit into someone else's, you know, definition of who you are, but just be yourself. And when you do that, you allow other people to also be themselves, which is basically saying to the other person, I love you. Mm -hmm. Just as you are, you know. So that's a, a, a really, um, always a very um, a big part of their messages. And then they also tell me, um, they keep saying the event is coming. 
um, that the time is drawing near and that the event is coming and that it's no, it's not the time to be wasted on anything but finding uh, love for yourself. Mm. At this event, I don't know what it is, but the, I'm assuming it's some the shift in consciousness that I've heard people discuss, but that times ahead are going to be very dark uh, because they say that when they when they had to contact me and I had a, a, this awakening, it was very dark. It wasn't this ah, butterflies and no, it was it was awful. Mm. Um, that's, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn, um, but that things are going to get very dark and that we, um, that I need to find the harvest. I'm st I still do not really fully understand what that means, the harvest, but that I need to find the harvest and bring um, everyone together so that the, our hearts can simultaneously beat together. Mm. I don't know how to do that, but um, I think it just means to bring everyone together in love. And, yeah, that's the best way I can interpret it. How, how would people find this? love that's available within themselves do they give any specifics for how to connect to that yeah so a big one is to accept yourself accept every even the darkness that's a big a big a big part is that we all have as humans we all have a dark side you can't unless you've reached heights of enlightenment that very few people reach we all have a dark side that's what makes us human and a lot of times we push that away or we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, look into, into that more or dissect it because of shame. Um, but once you can make peace with that side of you um, and, and love it and accept it and that's part of who we are, it doesn't mean that we are broken in any way, but I think that uh, oftentimes religion and you know, makes people feel shame about parts of themselves. Um, so that's a big one. And then also is to feel the pain. Don't try to avoid feeling pain happens. I think a lot of times when people are hurt, they look for a way out. They don't want to go inward at that time because it's painful. It's not easy. It's easier to just you know, numb yourself or whatever. But um, if you can get through that, that will allow you to, and that's also saying like, I love myself enough to sit with this pain and self-soothe and get through this period uh, by myself. I think that that's, that's a, a really good way to love yourself. And the main thing is really just acceptance. You know, there's something inherently wrong with everyone. That's what makes us human. Hmm. And I think if everyone could accept it for themselves, if every person said, you know what, I says there's something wrong with me and that's okay. If every person did that, I think we would be living in a much different place. And if, can you imagine if every person said, I accept you as you are, you know? I know you're flawed, but I still love you and I accept you. If everyone did that, that would just be what people, I think, are afraid to accept parts of themselves. So they also project their shame onto other people. Are there any other sort of big themes of things that they talked about besides uh, love and the event in the future? Um, no, I think the main themes is love, um, the event, um, the harvest. They, they, in the beginning, they talked a lot about the, the harvest um, and that was very strange. I would 
really, I still don't really understand that. Um, but yeah, their main theme is always love. They always bring it back to don't forget that you're a being of love. And they always tell me that they're proud of me and that like, this is a very difficult time to be alive, to be here um, and to take it easy on myself. And don't try to be perfect or um, don't try to pretend like everything's okay because this is a very hard time and just be, be present and accept the fact that you're okay and that you're always going to be okay. Um, that's another a big theme is like, you're always going to be okay, no matter what, which is just like the most comforting feeling to know that everything's going to be okay. You know, I get that I think a lot growing up, no, no fault of my parents, but um, that sense of everything is going to be okay. You, you're always taken care of. Um, yeah. What are some ways that these messages have shifted your life and that you've altered the way that you live your life because of? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. um, well, after, um, you know, I started channeling and really getting into it, I had just moved back. Well, not just, but I had moved back from Thailand, uh, the last place I was living. And my plan was come home, stay with my parents and then go on moved to LA, um, but then COVID happened. So that was, mm -hmm. uh, but they told me, you know, if you really want to leave, sell your car, and we'll take care of everything, just trust us. And I sold my car. And then like two weeks later, I got a, this company found me and offered me a job. And I moved to LA and um, was just walking and saw this school for, for professional psychology, professional psychology, and they were like, enroll in that school. Mm. So I did. Mm. And I want to try to bring, um, because, you know, I work on the psych unit at a hospital, and I think that a lot of our mental illness is spiritually um, caused by something with spirituality. A lot of people that have schizophrenia have had extreme trauma that they've never processed really painful stuff and um I think that a part of your soul leaves when it's that painful mm. you can't sit in this body and experience that much pain you just can't mm. um and I think that when that happens it's another break right you break open but what comes in is not your soul it's something else and at that part i don't know but i do know that majority of people with schizophrenia have experienced extreme trauma mm. that is not possible for the human body to contain so much pain mm. yeah so that's been um um kind of like the driving force um on this next chapter of my journey is like, I want to really try to incorporate spirituality into psychology. How, how often do you channel or connect to these beings? Oh, not enough. Hmm. I used to be all day and it was to the point where they were like, okay, you need to go live your life. Like they told me, hmm. stop you're not living this isn't the point you need to go experience but um um probably every other day um i used to have really big sessions that would last two to three hours long but i haven't had one of those big ones i'm hoping to have one tonight mm -hmm. i'm at my parents house where it first happened and it's nice and quiet here you know i live downtown la where there's a lot of negative negativity everywhere so it's kind of hard to channel there hmm. and what does it involve for you to to channel like what do you do to prepare yourself and what what's that what are you actually doing when you do channel um i sit in like a cross-legged position 
a spine straight. Um, lots of sage, lots of uh, kind of cleansing the room. Um, and then I move my hips in the circular to get that energy. And, and it, the energy kind of starts like uh, under my tailbone hmm. and then it shoots up. Once I can get that energy to start shooting up um, and then I, I do this thing with my hands that they kind of guide me to do. It's always like um, a triangle shape that I can then I twist. I do that for about five or 10 minutes. Um, I don't know why I do that. It's mm -hmm. just something that, like I, they, they, they tell me to do. They, they, they visually, they, I don't know. It's hard to explain. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to explain, but I do that. And then, um, yeah. And then I just say, love, only love, only my highest good. Oh, love, only love, only my highest good a few times. And then, yeah. Hmm. And then, yeah. Hmm. And then it's like, ah, it's like a feeling of just being like out of my human suit for hmm. a little bit. Hmm. Oh, I feel like. I'm just at peace, I'm at home, I'm with people that love me unconditionally and understand me, even though they're not people. It's just, I can't, it's like an energy that is just made of unconditional love. And so at that point, you're sort of cleared and um, mm -hmm. you're connected to them and sort of maybe in this like trance state and then messages start coming through and then you write them down. Is that right? I have my phone, I do it on my phone. So I get very still, as still as I can and then they just come through and um, it's, it's very hard to explain like the voice because it's my, it's not my voice um, and it doesn't go through my brain it doesn't get filtered through my brain mm. Mm -hmm. yeah but I, I i don't know I've, I've seen people channel and speak and walk around and i'm just like i, I, I cannot imagine doing that mm. so i have to be in a very still calm place and um do you think that this is something that anyone can do or that just some people can do? I think anyone can do it. I really do. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think that everyone, everyone has a higher self, right? So there's a part of you that's always trying to connect with you. But I think that a lot of people don't listen to that, their inner voice. Mm -hmm. But I tell people, I don't tell a lot of people but the few people who've asked me how to channel, I tell them just to start writing, just even with the, you know, pen and paper, just start journaling, writing, and don't judge what you write. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that, I, I do think anyone can do it. I do. I think my case was just so extreme in the way that it happened so fast because I was in a lot of pain and I was in a very, very dark place. Hmm. Yeah. Has that pain and that sort of difficulty healed for you or um, how has that been since then? Yeah, it's, I, if you would have told me <laughs> in the dark times um, that I would be living in LA working, you know, about to do my PhD, I would be like, there's no way. Mm -hmm. I can't even get out of bed. Um, it, it, is, it is like a new, a fresh new me. Mm. Yeah, I still, you know, I still go, can get dark, but I think that that's just part of being human and I don't judge myself as much anymore for getting um, sad. Um, things I, really affect me easily. I can get over 
stimulated with pain and seeing, you know, I live downtown, so I see people in pain a lot and, um, and I get sad. Mm. Yeah, but it's not, it's not, not nearly as dark as I was at that time. It's, mm -hmm. There's no, I, I would never wish that kind of pain on anyone. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, it was, it was awful. Is there a sense of gratitude for that period of your life? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I now know what I can get through and that I can do it uh, by myself. Um, you know, I, you, you still need support, but I didn't have a lot of support during that time. Um, so, the amount of pain I was able to endure just made me realize like how strong I am. And, um, and then I, I started channeling. I don't think I would have started if this would, if that didn't happen, if I didn't go through that, that dark pain. And then when you look at people um, who channel or people who, um, I don't know, but most people have gone through very dark periods. And the people that have come out on the other side of that, a lot of them have um, grown immensely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I know that pain is necessary and that it's gonna, it's always gonna be okay. And that when you look at a flower or a plant, you know, and you have to cut them so that they bloom. That probably hurts them, but it's necessary. Mm. That's a good metaphor for it. <laughs> mm. Mm. Can you say more about your sort of hopes for your PhD program and how you want to connect psychology to spirituality? Yes. Um, I would like to start studying people who have had psychosis or who suffer with um, schizophrenia um, and find out um, the trauma that they've been through. And I want to propose um, that part of the soul leaves the body when you go through that much pain. And because I've seen people who have schizophrenia or schizoaffective, they go on medication, but they're not quite the person that they were. It just calms the, the I guess, the psychosis, of, uh, for lack of a better word at that point, but it's, um, it's not them. It's still something is, is, they're still not the same person that they were. So um, yeah, my hope is that this will, I mean, it's gonna, I don't think I can do it all by myself, but my hope for the field is that the spirituality um, and the soul, the soul, people have such an aversion to that word spirituality. Okay, fine, the soul can be incorporated um, when we, when we when we look at mental illness. Um, because I do think if, if everything can kind of be solved with love, not to sound too like cheesy, but if you think about like, you know, your whole community embracing you and saying, it's okay, we love you. You know, tell every person saying one good thing about you mm -hmm. and how much love you and accept you. Can you imagine like, how I just think that, that that's what's needed is a lot more love um, and yeah I mean I do, I do think that the soul we need to look more into the soul and 
Um, let that kind of be a driving force when we look at mental illness, rather than just it being something in the mind, because the mind isn't really running the show. It's just the processor, right? So you can change the processor, but you, the soul is, is still there. Hmm. Yeah, so I think that that needs to be examined. Hmm. What, do, what do you understand the soul to be? Can you say more about that? I, I, the way I understand it, and I don't know if this is right, but I do think that the, that we were all created, we were all one, uh, broke off to have this amazing experience. You know, everything from the trees to the flowers to the to my dog Benny, um, and that. Um, but we're all one being. That, that this your soul is um, as a part is kind of like a, a a molecule right from this from the creator um, just having an experience so your soul is not a part of your human body but it's a, it's a, around you and above you getting filtered in through your brain to have this experience and filtered in through the eyes um, or the ears or, you know, for people that are differently able to touch. Um, but that we are all one. We are basically all one. We're all the same thing, just getting processed through different um, brains. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that was that probably was not very eloquent at all. <laughs> oh, that's okay, friend. It's helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, um, just curious to know how you understand it. So you, uh, yeah, it's a it's a difficult topic. So thank you for answering. Um, I do. Soul is ever. It's never going anywhere. Hmm. When these suits die for whatever reason the soul goes on um yeah and i think that we all live many lives so my um Daisha told me um this was amazing that i was alive in the 1900s early 1900s and that i lived in um, chino hills hmm. which is the area of california which i don't know anything about but that I was killed by a horse hmm. on the farm that I was a man um, <clears throat> and that when cars were introduced to the horse fell over on me and crushed me and killed me hmm. Hmm. Um, and I started looking into Chino Hills and it was all farm land and it's hmm. still a huge horse they have a huge horse community there um, and I've always loved animals. And uh, when I was like three, I, I had my picture taken on a horse and I was screaming bloody murder. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, you loved animals so much, but um, yeah, I think we all have, and have lived many, many lives. Mm -hmm. And we'll go on to live many lives. Do you foresee um, the activity of channeling and that skill that you've developed uh, connecting to your studies and the things that you hope to learn and share with psychology? I would love it to be. Um, it would certainly be like amazing if it could be accepted, but I just don't know if there are that community is ready for that. Mm -hmm. I still feel like there will be a lot of judgments about it, that until we can accept that there's a soul, right? All these other channeling and mediums and psychics and are still not gonna be accepted by everyone. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't still think that we're just a brain and a body. Mm -hmm. When we die, we just are, you know, warm food or whatever. But um, I think that if we can incorporate the soul into aspects of psychology, then yeah. But I would certainly love to. I think it would be 
a great opportunity, but no, I'm st I still get scared about like discussing channeling and stuff, and especially with like the scientific community. Um, yeah. What are some of the judgments that have come your way when you have talked about this to people? Oh my gosh, um, I've been told like um, that it's the devil. Uh, a cousin of mine told me that she's a Christian woman and what I'm doing is um, part of like a dark forces. Yeah, I've shown people like things that I've written, not that I've written, but that I've, you know, that I've channeled and they've said like, oh, that doesn't make any sense or that didn't, that doesn't mean anything to me. It's just you. Um, and those things hurt me because there's mm -hmm. such a profound experience for me. So, yeah, I need to get over the judgments, but it still brings a lot of feelings of shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sort of, um, how to put it, the sort of like stock objections in my mind, like there's definitely some like skepticism that has arisen and it's like, oh, well, like maybe you are lying or something or would be lying. And it's, and then like, for me, my actual experience, like reading, first reading the tweets that I found from you and then speaking with you because we've spoken before and, and speaking to you now, it's just like, um, well, I don't know. I don't know that I'm like especially good at detecting when people are lying, but to me, like you just come across as like you, you personally come across as just like very sincere and honest and forthright and like not it, it don't seem to be lying. And then um also uh the messages I mean that you shared are just um they they touch me personally and my heart and um feel very nourishing for me. And um I like I like to um use my own Twitter presence to share the wisdom that I found and the love that I found in my own heart. And then sometimes like I found myself wishing that I could read similar things from other people. And then it's like, oh, there's just this account that uh, has the things that I need to hear and that are so nourishing and so loving and like really restorative for me. And um, yeah. I think that like those two things of like both how genuine you seem and um, how nourishing and sweet and loving the messages are it's like i don't think that you're lying and these these beings seem beneficent rather than like you know if they were like oh please like write me a check or something or like you know like please go to this place and like i don't know do this weird thing or something this is very super sorry you're you're breaking up this is how you're gonna reach this is how you're... or this is you know you're going to conquer the world. Uh -huh. It's none of that. It's all just be yourself, <laughs> be loving. Can you say again, um, the last time we spoke, you said something that really touched me that I, I don't think I've read in any of the tweets that was about being kind. Do you, do you remember what you said to me last time? No, I think I just said to be kind to everyone. You said you said that uh, one of the things that they've said to you is that um, just being kind in our daily life is enough. That that like just being kind to people that's already enough. That you don't have to be special or go out of your way. Like just the the bar is sort of this is my paraphrase, but sort of like the bar is just like be kind to other people, and you're already doing great if you're if you can reach that bar. That's it. If you can just be kind and loving to people. That there's not really you don't really need to do much else <laughs> it's like such a such a um uh, when you said that it just uh oh. you know as with many of these messages was just very very nourishing for me because uh oh I, I don't know i have some ideas about like what i have to do to i don't even know what they are but like in order to be enough or have my life be you know a success or something or and it's like, oh, just being kind, it's just made so much sense. Like in this interaction, can I be kind? You know, that uh, I think that's that's um, that's an insight that's come to me before, but it's just sort of like being reminded of it. Like all I have to do is be kind and loving in this moment, in this moment, in this moment, in this interaction, in this interaction, you know, uh, that's it. Yeah. You know, I, I lived in India for a year. I did the meditation. I did the yoga i did the drum circle i mean i, I did it all, right and then i still was just me 
and I was like, I still have that empty feeling, you know, maybe it subsided for a little bit, but I still feel like me, um, you know, and you meet all these people who are like, oh, don't eat this, don't eat that, do this, don't eat this, that, da, da, da. I've got them, I know that, you know, you follow these gurus and stuff, but I think it's just as simple as just being kind and loving, especially to yourself. Yes. Uh, in yourself. Well, we've, we've talked a lot about channeling and also uh, some other topics. And I wonder if there's anything else that you'd like to talk about or dive more into. Um, you no, know, I, I do want to say that, that, uh, the spirituality community, I don't know how you would phrase that, can be a very murky, still judgmental place where you feel like you're still not good enough because you can't do this. You can't, you know, these little like affirmations that they say to do on a daily basis, do that. It, it's, it can be um, a still a way for you to judge yourself um, because, that in, that community has a way to, to have a lot of egos still, you know, and I um, uh, just wanted to tell people like, if you feel like you still don't belong there because of, don't let people to tell you that they're better than you or make you feel like they have the answers, make you feel like they are on this special journey that they've accomplished because of the, 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 the um, yeah, don't let that, don't, don't let people make you feel like you aren't special. Mm. You are. Mm. That's a beautiful yeah. message and definitely one that uh, I think is, is welcome and needed for people who've been in spiritual communities. And I know uh, that's a, a sweet message to hear. So thank you. Oh, we're all special. Yeah. No one's better than anyone. Especially on this planet. <laughs> it's yeah. like. I really feel increasingly like. Um, um, I guess I should say something about this. So uh, to take a step back, um, like part of the reason that I'm interested in having this conversation is like um, that I've had my own similar experiences to this that feel less about like connecting to a different being. Um, mm -hmm. Like I, I've not connected to the Daisha, but like it seems like connecting to my higher self and um, like being able to receive messages from that. And then I write them down and then I share them on my Twitter and like in my writings and stuff. And it's like, uh, yeah, like really try to share the wisdom that comes to me, both so that I can live according to it myself. And then also if it helps someone else. And um, anyway, one of the, one of, many things that's come is like just uh, a sense of everyone that's alive has a piece of the puzzle and it's not like oh like yeah like not like oh your piece is better than mine or mine is better than yours it's like no we need what you're bringing and the world needs what I'm bringing and everyone we know that's alive that's on the planet this time like everyone has something and if you I don't know it's been such a beautiful way of seeing to like when I see someone like look for oh what is the piece that they're bringing and like how can I recognize that and how can I shepherd that into uh, existence and like help them to share their piece of the puzzle and um, you know uh, that's that's been a really beautiful way of seeing for me and um, I that feels very clear to me talking to you it's like oh we we need your piece of the puzzle like thank you <laughs> I love that. that's so beautiful I really love that mm. yeah we all are made of the same thing mm -hmm. it's, it's just some of us have been through trauma some of us are raised to feel shame some of us are afraid to love ourselves because we've been told we're not good enough but yeah mm. i really love that it's really beautiful mm. yeah everyone has everyone like you said, everyone has um, an important part to play um, in this world. And um, yeah, 
and I, and I really thank you for taking time to speak with me. I'm not like a spiritual person, like I just a regular person. Like I don't have, you know, a lot of ties to the spiritual community. Like I kind of did when I was in India, but it just kind of, kind of turned off mm. a little bit. Felt like a lot of judgment still. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I really appreciate you taking time to meet with me and um, for anyone out there, if you'd like to message me on Twitter, I'm happy to, to talk to you and for a small fee. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I <laughs> a large fee, a really large fee. <laughs> but I would love for people to it just if someone gets anything from the messages that's like enough for me mm-hmm. even one person and you're the person so my job is like done I feel yes yeah, if, if someone's listening to this I'd really encourage them someone to go read through the messages that Olivia shared and um, they've you know I think I when I looked back on them a couple of months ago I was like oh I just like read them all in one night and they were all so so nourishing and uh really lovely so would definitely recommend that and yeah thank you so much for speaking with me about this I know that uh you know it's like a not common topic to talk about and you've experienced some judgment in the past so I really appreciate you sharing so freely and uh letting me have this conversation with you anytime anytime I'd love to come back mm-hmm. okay thanks friend <laughs>